Welcome to this podcast is making me thirsty. The number one destination for Seinfeld fans. This is the continuation of our 2024 Seinfeld best character bracket. Please check out our round one video before watching this to make sure there are no spoilers. Thanks again for tuning in. All right, moving on to round two now. We're going to go back to the Larry David bracket and number one seed versus number nine. We got Frank Costanza versus Jean-Paul. Jean-Paul, Tony, who's your pick? Yeah, again, listen, I, I think this is kind of an easier one. Uh, it's going to be tough. Uh, Jean-Paul, Jean-Paul, like, I love Jean-Paul, Jean-Paul. I mean, I'd love to see him make it to the Sweet 16, but Again, he he drew a tough card here with Frank. Um, so everything we said earlier kind of sticks here. F Frank's going to kind of move on a little bit easy here on this one. But, uh, um, you know, there's a lot here to still get through. But I think Frank makes it past John Paul. John Paul, uh, that's my that's my uh, nod on this one. Yeah, I think uh, Frank's resume is too strong uh, for John Paul, John Paul to overcome. Chris, your thoughts, though? Frank moves on. All right, there you go. You have it there. So that brings us to an interesting matchup here. Uh, we got a number five seed versus number four seed, Tim Watley versus Tony, uh, Hunky Tony. Uh, so, Chris, who you got in that one? Listen, pretty easy for me. I didn't think Watley should have moved on over Larry uh, from Monk. So uh, Dan Cortez, uh, Tony's just a, a, such a powerful character. Uh, the sandwiches, the rock climbing, uh, hunky Tony moves on. All right. Uh, that makes us, uh, go back to Tony, the non hunky one <laughs> for his pick <laughs> in this one. Yeah. Listen, uh, I thought Wiley got the nod against Larry. I, I just don't think he has enough to get him past Tony. I mean, there might be some people yelling right now. Wiley has a lot of episodes under his belt, but it's it's not enough for me for a character. I mean, Tony's a character and a half. You know, uh, they we have a jump, jump off that balcony. He says though, every every line the guy delivers is spot on. Um, Watley has a few moments here and there, and yeah, he puts his move on the lane a few times and everything else. But uh, anti dentite, um, say say what you want uh, about that. But uh, <laughs> Tony the Dan Cortez moves on as a four seed. Very well, very well. Tony is saying step off to Watley, and he advances. All right. So that means uh, we're going uh, to our next matchup, which is, uh, you know, she, she did an upset. Toby, 11th seed, she's now facing Morty. Uh, so, Tony, who do you got there? Listen, uh, Toby did make the upset, and I'm happy to see her advance, but uh, she's not getting past Morty in this case. Um, there's just too much there. Um, we're going to get to these tougher matchups as we move on, but Morty's a, a sweet 16 chalk them up, uh, as you would with, uh, with a Duke or a North Carolina or a Michigan state back in the day, uh, or Jim Bayheim. They're, they're clear to the, to the sweet 16 Morty's there as well. Yeah. Chris, I got to imagine you, you're, you feel the same way. Yeah. The Cinderella story ends here, Toby, but, uh, yeah, Morty, Morty moves on as a three seed. Uh, I don't know if I'm putting in Duke, North Carolina territory, uh, but he did, he did make it, he did make it past Toby. So, uh, the three seed moves on. All right. So that brings us down to, uh, Bookman, who's a two seed versus Moffitt, a seven seed. And Chris, uh, again, what do you got going on here? Yeah. I talked about Moffitt earlier, just iconic, uh, Episodes you just you just don't turn off. And forget about the Susie. You know, I know I, I shouldn't forget about it as an analyst. Um, but let's say I don't forget about it. That will weigh him down. Uh Bookman, again, the library, library cop. I mean, Bookman moves on. All right, and Tony, your thoughts here? All chalk in the David bracket. I think uh, first four seeds all advance to the Sweet 16. Book, uh, Bookman's in. Yeah, I definitely see Bookman moving on. So, yeah, uh, no issues there. Uh, all right, so we moving on to the Charles bracket uh, for round two. Uh, number one seed, Estelle versus Joe from Joe, Joe's Fruit Stand. And, Tony, who do you got here? Yeah, listen, Estelle was in 27 episodes. Um, 
were they all, you know, is, is she, you know, worthy of everything in all those episodes? The contest, yes. You know, the conversion, yes. Um, you know, there's a lot there where, where she might be the Chinese woman, yes. We have to take the breadth of the of the of the character. Um believe me, I am. I'm taking the breadth of the character. Um I'm gonna give her the edge here, but you know, Joe's fruit gave her a fight. I mean, Joe's fruit covered the spread, Joe's fruit was in it. Uh I just think there's enough of a stell. Uh, she, she's enough of a character, even. Uh, that's what we're talking about here, right? Uh, and I'm not taking advice from someone from Long Island. I mean, just right there is enough to kind of push her o- over the line here. So I'm going to stell uh, advancing. All right, thanks, Tony and Chris. Your thoughts? Yeah, a- excellent points. Um, Joe, Joe is like Linsanity, right? He he. He gave you a lot in a little bit of time, but it's hard to ignore the 20 plus episodes. It's hard to ignore the contest. Uh, you know, do we like the vans are rocking? No. Um, but it's still enough. It's still enough against Joe. Love Joe. He could probably beat some of these other people, but yeah, Stell's got to move on. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. And so that means that we got another four versus five matchup. At number five, Sid Farkas versus number four, Littman. Chris, what do you got? This is a really difficult one because these are two of my favorite characters, quite frankly. Um, but I'm take uh, I'm taking a step back, uh, you know. And I know Tony's going to mention the muffin tops, okay? But Lit- Littman represents pendant publishing, okay? Mike Lupica, um, the Cigar Store Indian, uh, just New York, like that. Pendant means something. You guys know I love Pendant. And guess who's the boss of Pendant? Mr. Littman. Nobody else could have played Mr. Littman. Clearly, they had the original Mr. Littman. They got rid of him. This guy was so perfect. And, you know, a great boss makes someone nervous and squirm. And Elaine, you rarely see Elaine do that. And this guy did it to her. And then obviously the awkward interview, all time, uh, you know, who do you read? (laughs) Mike Livica. I mean, this is tough. And I love Sid. Love. But I'm giving Littman the slight nod here. All right, Antonio, over to you. Uh, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, we know how is a Lipman guy. We know how is a pendant guy. Listen, I'm I am too. I I I'm not going to act like I'm not a Lipman guy. I mean, I, <laughs> Lupica, the conversation with George alone. I mean, he gave us was that wrong? Uh, you know, set aside the Elaine stuff, the you know the Ricky Henderson stuff. Uh, you know, the cigar serenity stuff. Him and Kramer's a great scene. Or how has that even mentioned? You know, you mentioned it, but you got to give him everyone else he's with, right? The the, the whole thing there. Um, it, I'm I'm you know, it, it sucks they brought him back in eight and nine. The muffin tops, the serenity now, right? These things they they definitely leave a sour taste in your mouth. Uh, I, I know how is not even letting it let it sway him at all. Um, you got to take the breadth of the character that that's there. It's, it's part of his legacy. Yeah, it wasn't great, uh, but you know he leaves pendant, and we still see him doing muffin tops. What are we doing here? Is that Lipman's fault? No. Do we still love the character? Yes. Now I'm doing uh, Luckner. But listen, uh, Farkas is so good. Summer nights. Oh, this is a tough one. This is a five four matchup for the ages. Um. Uh, you know what? This is a tough one, but sentimentality in a way is winning out on this one. Uh, it, it's, it's, I just keep going back to early Lipman. I keep going back to the conversations O'Hara was just talking about with the Orioles cap and the conversations, but George alone is enough and the whole cigar store. And what do you do around here, Elaine? You know, that the Kramer just comes in and just, you know, swipes the whole thing up. Uh, in a in a nail biter, I'm gonna give it a Lipman too. I'm gonna give it a Lipman over Farkas. 
Yeah, I, I, I definitely saw Littman moving on as well. So um, thank you, Tony. Uh, so that brings us to over to our next matchup, which is number 11, Tina versus number three, Jimmy. And Tony, we're sticking with you. Who's your pick? I know, this is a tough one. Listen, uh, Tina advanced for a reason. Um, as, as much as I, I love Jimmy, and I, I do love Jimmy, don't get me wrong. Um, he's kind of in a way, I think he represents more than what he actually is. If that makes sense. I think, I think if you rewatch the Jimmy episode and obviously, uh, we have, and I've done, uh, you know, it's almost like his legacy lives on more than, than, than him himself as the character. Uh, if that makes sense. Uh, I think, I think they play it out a little bit. I think he gets a little bit more play than he should. Um, Whereas it's the opposite for Tina. I think she doesn't get enough in the legacy. She doesn't get enough of the love. But you rewatch her episodes and she brings it. She brings it with Kramer. Kramer, are you coming back to bed? I mean, she nails the character. She told us about how she came up with that character, you know, with a water bottle, the whole thing. Uh, I'm going upset here. I'm going Tina. I'm going, I'm going Tina to move on to the Sweet 16. All right. All right, Tony. Big, bold pick there. Uh, Chris, what do you got? It's not bold at all. Seinfeld is a comedy. And I tell you, when I put these two head to head, I laugh. T Tina, to me, Siobhan Fallon's one of the funniest women in America. And Tony made a great analysis. Just great. I mean, Jimmy's more than the show. I don't even know what it means, but I know what it means. Okay. Tina moves on. All right. Well, there you have it, folks. Tina moving on. Uh, a lot of people out there are going to see that as an upset, but. Uh... Kudos to you guys for sticking with your guns. Uh, so that means uh, we are now going to uh, Alton Bennis versus Milos. So, Chris, what do you got in that one? Yeah, the dancing ends here for Milos. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, it's Alton Bennis. He, he, he moves on. The 2-7 the here. Milos had a nice run. Uh, but Cinderella's story is over for Milos. Uh, Elaine's dad moves on. All right. And Tony, you agree with that? Yeah. As far as characters go, it doesn't get better than this. The two of them scrum around the couch, uh, a lot of ice, uh, you know, funny man in Korea, the whole thing. I mean, this guy is, this is a no brainer as well. I didn't think Milo should have passed the first round, obviously, but let's easy, easy win for Elton on this one. All right. Yeah. I agree with that one as well. So uh, that brings us to our next bracket, which is uh, Melman for round two there. And again, we're going to start it off with the number one seed Newman. And uh, he's facing off against Mr. Pitt this time. Who do you got? Uh, and that's uh, Tony. We're staying with you. Yeah, we got all chalk up here, too, I think, in this first couple anyway, right? One verse eight, Newman, Mr. Pitt. Um, I, I gave Pitt the nod in the first round. And, and you know you know, I'm not a big Pitt guy, but uh, I thought he deserved it over Wilhelm. Um, I don't think he deserves it over Newman. Um there's just too much there with Newman and Newman's one of these characters. And this is the interesting part about it. You know, and we're seeing where we're landing here. Like, do they ruin Newman a lot? Yes. Do they bring Newman to things they don't bring Newman into? Yes. But I mean, just talking Newman, the boyfriend, just talking Newman, the suicide, uh, you know, even the bottle deposits, I like Newman. And I know that might be pushing towards later years. I don't love, I don't love the, the ticket pitch Newman. Sometimes they just bring him into stuff with, uh, you know, the, the white whale stuff either. I don't love, and we'll get there. Uh, you know, bringing son of Sam's, uh, uh, you know, mailbag and all these things are, are, are not good Newman's. Um, but I don't think they're not good Newman's to get him to get him to, to lose to Mr. Pitt. So, uh, he advances here. Uh, he's going to the elite eight, in my opinion, Newman, Newman moves on. Thank you, Tony. And Chris, uh, your thoughts on Newman versus Pitt. Newman and Pitt, yeah, I agree with Tony here. I'm not going to spend too much time um, as he made a lot of good points there. Mr. Pitt, uh, one win wonder, okay? But, uh, yeah, Newman moves on. Yeah, I agree with that. So, all right, thank you. So now our next matchup is, again, a 4-5, and it's a Babu versus number four seed, Banya. And, Chris, who do you got there? Interesting matchup here. I love love a four or five matchup in the second round, uh, as I do in the, in the NCAA tournament as well. I talked about it earlier. Uh, how how Banyan was Banyan was just solid, right? Um, never let you down. And guess what? That means a lot. You know, 
People don't let you down. Those are guys you want in your corner. Those are the guys that can advance and can make things happen in life and in sports. But this is Babu. <laughs> the cafe, the visa, throwing the finale for, 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 for shits and giggles here. Uh, All-time stuff. For me, Babu uh, easy, easily moves on here with Banya. All right. Thanks, Chris. And Tony, uh, your thoughts on Banya versus Babu? Easily moves on, huh? See, I'm I'm having a tougher time with this one than 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 O'Hara. Um, I don't know about easily. Um, I I, I think I think Banya Banya is one of those characters that that to me is he's a he's like above putty. He he he's there. Like, like we talked about earlier, he delivers when he needs to deliver. They kind of bring him in, they bring him out. Uh, the soup conversation, I'm huge, although. Ovaltine stuff a little bad, um, you know. So O'Hara has been playing this game all day with these with these brackets where he doesn't he doesn't let the eight nines you know sway him. He doesn't let bad episodes sway him. It's the character, not the episode. You know, I, I'm trying to play along with that a little bit myself as I'm I'm, I'm giving I'm giving Banya some some bigger points than he actually deserves because I think later on they kind of do ruin him with the Ovaltine stuff and everything else. Um, but listen, all that said, the cafe alone, and you throw in the visa. The cafe, you can watch the cafe a hundred times and you'll laugh your ass off every time with Babu and Jerry stringy, stringy, you know, the whole thing with Kramer and the napkin, uh, you know, it, it, it's just too much there that the, the, that the, the character that Babu became with the finger point and everything else that kind of, uh, maybe cartoonish eyes him. That's later on. That's not the show. That's not the early show. That's not the cafe that we love early on the foundation stuff. Um, Babu, Babu advances. All right, thank you guys. So that uh, we're penciling Babu uh, to advance against uh, Newman in the next round, and we'll get back to that later on. Uh, so that brings us over to the Moyle versus Jackie Childs, and uh, Tony, who do you got in that one? Yeah, here's another one, Jackie Childs. So, so you know. <laughs> We love the introduction to Jackie Childs, the whole thing with, uh, you know, um, uh, what's his face there, Johnny Cochran. He, he actually had a connection to Johnny Cochran in real life, which is crazy, he told us about. But I think Jackie Childs is one of those characters, too, that kind of became bigger than he needed to become. Uh, he's one of those things kind of, you know, I'm not going to call him the soup Nazi, right? But I am going to say he got more play than maybe he deserved based on how well the actor performed and the embellishment of the character the 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 you know the, the memes the it lives on right jackie Childs lives on the egregious preposterous you know the three things every time and this may come as a surprise because i wanted moyle out first round but in this matchup if you want to talk character you want to talk delivery you want to talk you know steals the show shines all of that stuff I think the Moyle gets an upset here over Jackie Childs. I think Jackie Childs uh, may be bigger than we think he is in our minds. Okay. So I'm going Moyle on this one. All right, Chris, that's up to you. It does uh, the Moyle upset Jackie Childs. He does. Uh, my partner convinced me here. Uh, and he's not even a Moyle guy, which is incredible. But yeah, Jackie, you know, it's kind of every episode is the same. Who started with mom on? Preposterous. Like, you know, the Moyle gave you that one and done and left a mark. Okay. Uh, now, listen, and again, or it was season five. Uh, Jackie came later seasons, and it just, I, I think you're right here. I think he became bigger than what he was supposed to be. If they just, maybe if he had that one episode, right? During just when the OJ stuff happened, but just I mean, bringing them back over and over, and it's hard to argue. Thirty-seven million people watch this, thirty-five million watch that. I get it, but as an analyst for the best character, uh, I'm going to go the Moyle. All right, well there you have it, folks. Uh, the Moyle over Jackie Childs, uh, and that means uh, we got one more uh, matchup, and that is number ten Ping versus number two putty and uh chris again uh who do you got in this matchup <laughs> i love this matchup 
And I'm going ping. Putty, I don't know, 10 episodes of Putty. How many times can you see him and Elaine break up? Do me a favor, folks. Go watch The Dealership, okay? And tell me what you think. Then go watch, you know, Ping on the Couch talking to China. Ping getting hit by the car. Pea Pods. She's a shock. Do me a favor and watch those episodes. I talked about it. Fabric of the Neighborhood. He's what New York is all about. I don't care about the Arby's line. I don't care about the, uh, you know, the, the move. I don't care about any of it. Ping in my book is a better character. He moves on. All right. Uh, and over to Tony now. What do you got there? Who's who's your pick? Yeah, funny how uh, uh, about a half hour ago, this guy's yelling at me, don't worry about the episode, worry about the character. <laughs> now he's telling us to go watch the dealership. Fine, be that as it may. Uh, our producer here has got the putty shirt on. I'm sorry to do this to you. And I might be surprising some people as well. In this matchup, Ping wins. And, and, and the reason why Ping wins is a lot of stuff O'Hara just talked about, but more so, Putty... Putty is in this is this is like fascinating to me as, they, as Putty is in the you know the 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 face painter right season six he's not in season seven or eight and then somehow they just say let's bring back Putty for season nine and let's just put him in all these episodes that are higher mentioned just shove him on in and give him these lines and let him do his thing and everyone will laugh it's like He's not. I would take Jay Trammell almost over Putty. I I, I loved him in the lean dynamic. This, this Putty lean dynamic thing. It was almost like they just said to Julius Dreyfus, "You have a good rapport with Putty. We like Warburton. He's a fun guy. Let's bring him into all these episodes. Let's give him some." But that's not the show, man. Like to Harris' point, you know, the the Chinese delivery guy getting on the phone with China about a bomb. I mean, that really happened, and that's that's the show. Uh, Ping advances. Not even the Clarkman can save uh, Putty in this round. So uh, Ping moves on. That's a that's an upside in, in our books here. Uh, so let's move on to the next bracket. Going to the Tom Sharona's bracket. Uh, we're starting it off. All right, this is an interesting one. Number one, Peterman versus number eight, Sue Ellen Mishke. Uh Tony, we're staying with you again. Who, who do you got here? Yeah, I mean, this is not an easy one for me because – we're talking characters and no one's a crazier, more wild character than Peterman. Right. Uh, you know, somehow based on the real guy, which at the time, I don't know who the hell actually knew this catalog. I guess it was a thing, but I'm not sure people were reading it. Maybe Jerry and Larry just stumbled upon it, whatever it might be. Um, you know, uh, love, you know, both of these are friends of the show. Um, every point I just made about party could be made about Peterman. I mean, Peterman gets played out. Peterman gets, you know, thrown into stuff when he doesn't need to get thrown into stuff. Uh, characters, Sue Ellen Mischke, the way she just struts up to Elaine and the thing, you know, in, in, in the, uh, in the bottle deposit, how she outbids her, uh, you know, it doesn't fit. There's a lot there. And she was brought, she was brought back for purpose, for a reason. She delivered every time she was brought back. Um, you know, she's got, so much stuff going on with her where she's an heiress. She's got the braless wonder stuff. She's, she's a lane's nemesis, right? We talked about George's nemesis with, uh, with, um, you know, what's his face there? Uh, Braun. She's a lane's nemesis and, uh, she needles her a lot. And I'm going to take out the one seat. If I can, I'm going to on Mishki over Peterman. All right. Wow. All right. Uh, Chris, who do you got? Does it stick? It sticks. Uh, listen, those these later seasons loved Peterman, but you can't just throw him in episodes and say it, it, it doesn't count. And unlike previous bosses, like a uh, uh, Mr. Pitt or obviously even uh, uh, Lippman, you know, there's there's ones you remember. I I, I don't have a I know I think they're gonna kill. Oh, what about the JFK? Yeah. I don't have a anchor Peterman, okay? And that's a problem. If you don't have an anchor to any of these guys, it's hard to move on. I know he's in 20-plus episodes. I get that. But Tony made great points about Sue Allen. She came back with a purpose. This show's about purpose. It's about relatability. 
and she knocked it out of the park. Like we pinned her the whole with the Indian wedding. Didn't even love that episode, but she was really strong. Um, and it was centered around her. So yeah, I'm rolling with the upset here. Uh, Sue Ellen Mischke uh, moves on, knocks off the one seat. All right. Uh, Brenda strong coming in strong against Peterman. Uh, and we love John O'Hurley, uh, but, uh, great points there. Uh, so yeah, Sue Ellen Mischke moving on in a, in a stunning upset. Uh, that leads us over to, uh, Chris. Again, we're going with a four or five matchup on uh, this time. Crazy Joe Javola, uh, number four seed versus Helen, uh, Seinfeld. Who do you got? Yeah, to me, this is, you know, Helen's like, uh, Don Sutton. I mean, just pitched for 20 years, but never really had a shiny moment. You know, Tony mentioned the, the one line. How, how can anyone not like him? I mean, we're, we're going to answer for one line. Um, <laughs> Helen never brought much to the table. And I mentioned, if you're more well-known, I kind of remember her still from Alf, for crying out loud. So, you know, if she's more remembered in my mind for Alf, I can't push her forward. Crazy Joe's an all-timer. I'm, I'm pushing him forward uh, in this 4-5 or five matchup that I don't I don't think is as, it's as close as it should be. Okay, very good. Uh, Tony, your, your thoughts on this matchup? Yeah, I agree. That's enough said. I don't know if I'm going to take any more time on this one. To me, Helen's the least of the parents. She's almost on level with the Susan parents. Almost. She's got a step above that. But other than that, Crazy Joe is, is an easy win for me on this one. Uh, moves on as a four seed. Yeah, I, I think everybody's in agreement with that one. Uh, so no issues. Uh, so that brings us to an 11. Wow, two – Versus number 14, two uh, higher seed teams going at it. Uh, close talker versus Mr. Morgan. Uh, take it away, uh, uh, Tony. What do you got in this one? Yeah, it's a tough one. Listen, uh, this is a very close one. Um, the close talker made it here. I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, by the skin of his teeth, um, you know. Now that he's here, he he read it. This is one of those, like like you mentioned, 11-14. They both got there, uh, weren't expecting to be there. Two kind of Cinderella's. In this case, though, uh, Morgan Morgan gets, I mean, he probably would have beat Braun if Braun won, to be honest. Now I'm looking at the bracket. I think Mr. Morgan moves out as a 14th seed. I mean, there's so much. Just, yeah, you screw me again, Costanza. I'm going to keep going back to that uh, because that's the character. That's the essence of the character. We all got that person at the work who's just like, why? You, you screwed me again, Costanza. You know, you, you framed the thing before I could sign it. You know, you winked at my wife. You know, everything he's doing is just screwing because, you know. So, uh, yeah, Morgan advances over uh, Judge Reinhold as much as I loved him as a character. And I thought he really delivered that role. Um, you can't argue Tom Wright in this case. Yeah, I, I, that's an all-time line that he gives. You know, you screwed me again, Costanza. So, Chris, over to you. What's your pick here? Uh, who's moving on? Yeah, G George may have something here. What was it, the uh, the PBS thing? We do it off with Channel 11. Love to mention that as well. Yeah, Morgan moves on. Uh, you know, I'm and this time I think I'm actually in agree with you guys uh, that Mr. Morgan should move on. Um, so, wow, number 14 scene moving on. This is March Madness. Uh, so that brings us down to our final uh, matchup in this bracket uh, for Sharonas. And that's a uh, number 10 Kruger versus number two Klumpus. Uh Chris, who's your pick here? Not much time needed on this one. Uh, it's Jack Klumpus. Uh Kruger barely escaped the first round, but uh, Jack Klumpus, 55 year old Jack Klumpus at the time, um, he moves on. Hopefully to face Mr. Morgan if Tony agrees here. I think Tony agrees. Tony, you agree? Yeah, Klopas is moving on. All right, there you go, folks. Uh, so now that uh, finishes all the brackets for round two, so we're going to go to the Sweet 16. All right, we're getting through these. And we're going back to the Larry Charles – I'm sorry, uh, the Larry David uh, uh, bracket. And this time, again, number one seed. He's still alive. Frank Costanza versus Hunky Tony. And Tony, start us off. Yeah, we got all chalk here in this bracket. And uh, now it's going to get difficult. Um, I, I, I've been doing a lot of thinking on this one since we kind of started this, uh, you know, 
Frank Costanza, we say he's an all timer. I'm a sucker for the parents. We all know that. But am I? You know, what 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 makes you a sucker for the parents? Why is Frank Costanza so good? You know, who's having sex with a chicken? That's a late season. O'Hara doesn't even love that, I don't think, so much, right? Cigar Star Indian, it's a prophylactic rapper. Uh, you know, uh, you know, th- there's a lot of Frank Costanza. You know, the Steinberg, the 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 Jay Buhner line is is an all timer. You know, Frank gets, you know, he's he's sort of uh what's the word? He becomes, you know, he's he's it's almost to his detriment that he became so good, right? The writer started writing him, the Serenity Now stuff, the yelling at Estelle stuff, the 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 Van Camarock and stuff. At some point, you gotta you gotta put it all together and look at the totality of the character and match it up against a one timer who comes in and just nails it the way Tony does the way, I mean, the way he works with George back and forth, the way he works with Kramer on the rock, the Elaine stuff, jump off the balcony stuff. There's so, this is not an easy pick folks. It's not Frank just advances for no reason. I mean, if you start adding up because Frank Costanza's stuff, I mean, lock, stock and barrel, uh, you know, the Buner stuff, there's a lot here. It's not an easy decision. I it sounds like I'm leaning one way. I'm just making a case for I'm making a case for Cortez, but I'm I'm giving it to Frank and I'm I'm passing Frank along barely. He's in if I'm he's in if, even as I'm saying it, I'm not even convincing myself because I think that I think that if you're talking about characters, I feel like the 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 hunky tony character is, is an all timer. Everything about it's perfect. Go with your gut. Go with your gut. Tony advances in my book. That's my gut. That's my gut. You're yelling at me to go. Wow. My gut. That's my gut. That's my gut. Because, because I'm looking at it and I'm saying, you know, we're talking bookmen up, right? We're talking these people up for a reason. Why is Frank getting talked up? Because he's Frank Estanzo. Yeah. But I mean, Jay Buhner. Uh, prophylactic rapper. You're talking lines. You're pulling out lines. Who's having sex with a chicken? These are all great lines. But when you're talking like a one character, when we're not talking just one character, but we're talking about a character, I think the 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 sums it all up. But do you think I jump off that balcony? Where's my popcorn, babe? The whole thing. Uh, I'm gonna give Cortez a nod. Then that's that's where I was leaning. That's where I'm going. Wow. All right, Tony. Uh, thanks. Uh, so that means, uh, Chris, um, does Tony move on or are you going to be able to save Frank for a moment here? And that is, that's bold. That's bold. That's bold analysis. I, I couldn't, I couldn't let him not go where he wanted to go to appease people. So I respect that. Now with that said, Frank is a one seed for a reason. You know, he, he's saying lines, this, that. Okay. But I think it's a generational thing. That era, they brought in that older era to this kind of younger, younger era, and the way he spoke, I don't even. I felt like it wasn't even scripted. It was just something I could. It was like, it's like yeah, you know, I don't know. It's like you're having a beer with your father. Like the way they speak, it's just different. It was even more different, and uh, this was, that was the '90s, right? But it was even more like like this guy's like just wild. He just says what he wants to say, and you know he's firm in what he believes, right? He's like, remember, he wasn't born in America, you know. Screw them. I, I love everything about him. Um, I love their relationship, whatever it was, with uh, Estelle. Uh, the way he treats his son, don't mess up with the Yankees. Hits him in the head. I mean. Uh, you're getting an appointment with the mayor. I mean, just he was New York. He's everything right about. He's everything right about everything for me. So for me, Frank moves on. So Tony, you said you picked Tony, and Chris, you picked Frank. So that's a tiebreaker. So you know what, the lead eight. He's being played in Del Boca Vista, and you can't keep Frank Costanza out of Del Boca Vista, so he moves on. All right, so that means we got one uh, other matchup to go, and Chris, number three, Morty, versus number two, Bookman. Who do you have? 
Bookman versus Morty, the two old timers. Uh, I know my partner loves Morty. I actually like original Morty even a little bit. The whole, uh, you know, I love that guy for some reason. He set up the stakeout, but uh, obviously the, the real Morty took over, did a great job. Uh, but again, when he puts on, like, we think about the later years, and I know I don't, but the big stupid glasses, the number one dad, I mean, the nonsense of running for president, like, there was too much of a focus on him. It just, it got cartoonish. I think you know where I'm going here. Uh, Bookman, I mentioned it, the authoritative figure was as powerful as it got on television. Um, that monologue, if you will, whatever you want to call it, find me one better in television history. Uh, so for me, the two seed moves on, Bookman. All right. Well said. Uh, Tony, do you agree with that? Well, it's interesting. I painted myself into a corner, but uh, listen, I, uh, you know, listen, I, we're, 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 is Frank amazing? Yes, of course. Is am I happy he moved on? Yes. I, I had to go with, I had to give Tony uh, his due. Um, this is another one. It's kind of the same, same thing. Uh, you know, if I'm playing that same card, Bookman's the choice here. He came in, he delivered great character. One line, you know, had his the mentioned the whole thing. I love when he, when, I love when he catches the librarian and Kramer and two that's don't sleep on that part of it. Um, I love Morty. Uh, you know, Harris not wrong. I love Morty. Stay on Biscayne from, from stay on Biscayne. He had to Harris point about Frank. You can say the same thing about Morty. Morty talked in that language too. Morty with the, you know, the, the I get a good Chinaman on 42nd street to get me a cheaper garment. When he's talking to Peterman, you know, Morty had that also, you know, the, the whole, ah, and hell with him, the whole thing with Columbus. I, I love that stuff. And to Iris point, you, you know, you nailed Frank as well with that stuff. The way they talked was great. You know, Tommy tune, the whole thing, the silver dollar, uh, you know, the old, the old folk, they, they got a place in my heart. Uh, I, I want to give the nod to Morty, but I, I gotta, I gotta be fair to, to the essence of the, of the bracket, which is characters. I did it with, with I just did it with Tony. I, I, it's the same thing. I mean, Bookman's got to move on in this case only because of, of everything we talked about. He comes in, he steals the entire show. We still talked about to this day, uh, as one of the greatest of all time. So, uh, going to be a hell of a matchup in in the elite eight for the, for those two so bookman moves on one and two advance all right yeah very well bookman uh advancing uh so uh, i think um you know it's it's, it's hard to see your some of your favorites go but you know it's gonna get tougher and tougher now uh so that's uh finishes up uh the david bracket so that brings us to the sweet 16 in the charles bracket First up is number one, Estelle Costanza versus number four, Littman. Uh, again, Tony, we're staying with you. What do you got? Yeah, listen, I, I almost I almost just bounced Frank, and I can't believe I did that because he's obviously one of my favorite characters of all time. Uh, and, and Frank Frank is not Frank without Estelle. George is not George without Estelle. Uh, I, from the introduction to, uh, you know, in the contest or her laid up on the bed, you know, you can sell a mask or a garden. To, I'm not taking advice from a woman from Long Island. Uh, you know, I made all these sandwiches. Have a bologna sandwich. <laughs> bring him, bring him to your building. She tells Jerry when they're moving George in. That's a that's an old time mom line right there. You know, uh, just you know, George, why won't you? Why won't you? the way she talks to George, the way she needles George, the way the way everything about her. I mean, you talk about a character. She's a character. Uh, you know, as much as we love Littman. Uh, his later seasons is not getting him past the Sweet 16 in my book. Uh, you know, if they ended Lippman early on, perhaps, um, you know, you know, it's come to my attention. You'd have, you have had sex with a clean woman on your desk and all timer, obviously, um, you know, as, as O'Hara mentioned, needle in the lane a little bit here and there. But for me, this has got to be a stale, the one seed uh, moving on. OK, thanks, Tony. And uh, Chris, uh, who's your pick here? Part of me wants it to be Lippman. My heart wants it to be Lippman. But my partner makes good points. I, I can't knock Estelle off yet. I mean, Lippman, I love him. You know, oh, my accountant, Lenny West. I mean, he, he just, everything's so normal, yet funny with Lippman. Uh, so I tip my hat to him. I tip my hat to him. But begrudgingly, Stell moves on. Once he moves on. 
Yeah, he tried to grind it out against Estelle, but just came up too short. So uh, moving on to Elite Eight, Estelle Costanza, which brings us to the other uh, matchup left, which is uh, Tina versus Alton Benes. Uh, Chris, who's your uh, pick here? Hmm. This is this is harder than than you may think, uh, based on what I talked about with with Bookman as that authoritative figure. But Tina makes me, you know, what makes you laugh? Is it is Alton Bennis making me laugh, or is the way Jerry and George react making me laugh? I think I answered my question there. Tina moves on for an all-female Elite Eight. So you say. Tony, over to you. What's your, uh, what's yeah, your uh, I mean, pick here? I mean, that's an interesting take. Uh, uh, who, who are we laughing at was the, was the question posed and then answered by, by, uh, by my co-host here. But listen, uh, we're laughing at their reaction to him because of who he is, right? I mean, the presence he presents, uh, you know, another scotch, uh, who's the funny man, drivel. I mean, everything the guy says. And, and yes, we are laughing at their reaction. But if that's played by anybody else, are we getting that reaction? Is it, is it sticking? Is it me? Is, are we feeling what they're feeling on that couch? Are we trembling? Are we in the bathroom saying we got the hell out of here? We're not doing any of that if it ain't this guy there doing it and and being Alton Bennis. So it's going to be a tiebreaker here. Uh, I'm going Alton Bennis for sure on this one. Uh, Tina, we love you. But uh, in my mind, this is where it ends for you in the Sweet 16. You know, the jacket is one of these all-time uh, best episodes. Uh, and I always loved Alton in it. Um, but, you know, Tina also, great performances from her as well. Uh, but quite down course, boy. Great line. And I'm giving it to Alton in this one. Alton's moving on, facing Estelle in lead eight. And we'll get back to that matchup uh, later on. So, yeah, thank you guys for your uh, your picks there. All right, so the Mellon bracket, we're going to start off again with the number one seed, Newman, uh, who is going against Babu. And, Tony, who's your uh, pick here? Yeah, so far we got chalk across the board on the other side of the bracket, folks. Um, I'm going to throw a wrinkle in that on this one. Um, I know everyone loves Newman, but uh, – the more uh, the more we've been talking through this bracket, the more I'm I'm leaning more towards these characters that really defined the show. Uh, you know, Newman's there. Yes, Newman's always involved. He's involved too much. Uh, and, and I can't look past that in this case, only because it's Newman, right? You know, the, the switching the mail job with with Jerry, the bringing the mail bag to Kramer, the there's just. You know the 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 scoff law stuff. It's just so much with with Newman, especially later years, making the sauce, the Kenny Rogers chicken, the Merv Griffin. I mean, they just bring Newman in every time, and it just dilutes him further and further and further down from just that little needling nemesis who just kind of pops in on the suicide to you know full blown Jerry chasing him around the apartment and everything else with the with the with Pam and the and the scrunchie. It, it just overplayed your hand. Uh, you got too complacent. Something like Babu, you didn't get time to not like him because he was just in and out, and 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 you love him, and they bring him back for the finale, and we all get to see him again. But the essence of Babu is there early on with the cafe and the visa. I'm going five seed Babu with the upset over Newman in this one. All right, uh, excellent pick there. Uh, and Chris, over to you. What do you got? Couldn't agree more. I mean, Babu, oh, has a special place in my heart. The guy, I mean, the str- I mean, uh, you know, I mean, you know, very bad, bad, or you're a good man. I mean, I that episode that Tom Leopold wrote, and we talked to Brian George was, I mean, we say underrated. We probably gave it an AA plus, but he was so good. And to Tony's point, you, you didn't. He didn't grow to not like him. They brought him back in impactful moments. Melbourne, they brought him back, obviously, in the visa. Um, just, like, another 
New York character. I know he's Pakistani, but like that neighborhood guy, the guy you root for, um, and they built the whole show around it. It's just marvelous. So uh, Newman, yeah, you tip your hat, but again, watered down. You like a little early Newman, gets too cartoonish. So uh, an upset perhaps, but I think it's a legit five seed here moving on. All right, yeah, very well put. Uh, so that means uh, we're going to our next matchup. And Chris, again, staying with you, number six, the Moyle versus uh, number 10, Ping. Who do you got? So this break gets fun and interesting because I've I've been consistent with both of these guys. Uh, my partner's, you know, kind of bounced around. I don't think he chose either of these guys in the first round. And here we are. I mean, that's that's the beauty of March Madness, right? And they're both very different. You know, one had that huge impactful moment. The other is just that that weaver, you know? Um, you know, just slipping in there, doing his thing, and the big, having big moments. Um, but the for me, the, the fact, this is a tough one. Uh, sometimes you just got to go with your gut. And I've been a ping guy for a long time. And I don't know if it's the New York Knicks jacket or the other thing that's swaying me, his, his little haircut, his just, his excitement. He just, and he makes everyone like, hey, hey, Kramer. Like, I love how he just talks to everybody. Like, he's he's kind of part of the building, part of the neighborhood, like Tony mentioned. And that's what this show, this country, is all about neighborhood and coming together. And I think Ping, uh, Puts a cherry on that top. So, for me, ping moves on. All right, Chris, thank you. Uh, Tony, who is your pick in this matchup here? Yeah, here, the thing about ping is he's sneaky. As O'Hara mentioned him as a weaver, I'm going to talk about him as being sneaky because he's in four episodes, folks. It ain't just one or two kind of pop-ins. You know, the whole thing with the shark. You know, he, he's there for that. He's he's there in that the virgin, you know, uh, the the visa, the kind of back-to-back stuff. And they bring him kind of back in the pilot to give a little, like, you know, why he's he's around. Ping is there, man. And, and you know, the tape is what I, I keep going back to this. It's an all-timer. The guy just walks in and makes himself at home on the couch. I mean, what's more New York than that? Knows Kramer, the Chinese delivery guy on the phone with China. Jerry's like, can I help you? It's a long distance call, you know, starts talking Chinese to the guy. I, there's a lot here, man. And, and to me, and you're right, I didn't pick either of them. But now that they're here, uh, you know, Ping is is it to me is a is a bigger character than the Moyle. I mean, the Moyle. The Moyle delivers, but he delivers he, the, his three scenes are kind of the same scene over and over again. He does that. You could, you can't see Bookman does a little bit different. Bookman does the thing with Jerry, but then in the library, he's a little bit different. So he doesn't just repeat himself. Um, whereas the Moyle just kind of is that big, loud guy the whole way through the fight with Jerry. I'm going to take Ping as well. Ping is, uh, Ping, Ping is moving on. In this matchup, Ping is moving on. Uh, he advances. All right, a 10 seed going to the Elite Eight. All right, uh, March Madness continues. All right, and continuing on to the Sharonas uh, bracket, we are going with Sue Ellen Mishke, 8 seed versus Joe Davola, 4 seed. Tony, again, we're staying with you here. What do you got for your uh, pick in this round? Listen, I, I've been I've been riding Sue Ellen through and through here. The upset over Peterman. Um, you know, beat the bubble boy out in, in a close one early on. Uh, but for me, she's not she's not getting past Crazy Joe Davola. This guy is just too good, too strong. You're under no obligation to shake my hand. Uh, you know, fear is our most primal instinct. I mean, the whole thing, one of the greatest characters of all time. Uh, it has to be moving on in this in this instance to me. Love uh Sue Ellen. Um, just a great character uh, as she showed to get this far, but uh, she it ends here for her in my book. All right, and Chris, uh, your thoughts on that matchup? Yeah, uh, we knew he was going there, but here's the problem with Davola. Okay, it's season four. I think he gets lost a little bit in season four. Okay, you got a lot of great guest characters in season four. Okay, we kicked out my guy uh, Dow Rimple. Uh, a ton of the a ton of the girlfriends, a ton of that stuff. Uh, we mentioned Ping. Uh, Sue Ellen stood out 
a little more and represented more. I, I think she made a bigger impact as a character um, for the episode she was in. Uh, you mentioned Browless Wonder and O. Henry Bar, like two massive uh, storylines, if you will. It, it's a close one. We all love Crazy Joe. But as an analyst here, seeing these two matched up, you know, seeing her just walk down the street, oh, crap, oh, God, led to such greatness. Uh, I'm moving Sue Ellen on. So uh, our producer is a tough decision here. Tough position indeed, uh, but I get to play devil's advocate as fan and uh, analyst. And Crazy Joe pushed the kibosh on Sue Mishki here, and he's moving on. So, Crazy Joe, Devola. And that means our last uh, matchup here is number 14 seed, Mr. Morgan, versus number two, Klompus. Uh Chris, uh you know, you, we talked both of these characters up. Uh, who's moving on? Listen, d just so we're clear, everyone in this Sweet 16 Elite Eight are incredible characters. So by knocking one off, it's, it's not that we don't like that person. It's just we favor one a little more, what they represent, uh, the whole thing. And for me, you know, you know me. I, listen, I don't want the lady da, 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 like the early years. But there's something about this guy, and I can't get him out of my head. Mr. Morgan, you know, Tony says in four episodes. I felt like he was in 400 episodes, you know. The Channel 11 stuff. You screwed me again, Costanza. I mean, his character was just a perfect fit for everything this show was trying to do, um, especially those later years with the Yankees. Clompus, yes, the pen. But, you know, listen, if you're going to play Tony's game here, you know, the pen was a great episode. But the other episodes, I don't know. Like, as vice president, I don't know. Like, all that nonsense in Florida dragged him down a little bit. Mr. Morgan never got dragged down. The guy was consistently, consistently great. So... And that's what this, this show is about, those kind of characters. Talked about Ping, Abu, Mr. Morgan. You know, these th these are the guys that just, you, you just, you feel comfortable watching. Um, you pull for, because they're kind of at, at odds with some of the main characters. Um, where Klampus, Klampus is more of a, a side character with Morty, if you will. Mr. Morgan was straight on with George. I think that pulls a little weight here, so... Uh, an upset for many, but I'm going to 14 seed here. All right. All right. Uh, and uh, Tony, uh, your thoughts, uh, who do you got? Yeah. Interesting. A lot, a lot there to, to, to uh, kind of dive into because, you know, he, he's going to a different couple of different places there. So does Columbus get, get brought down? As you mentioned, I, I don't think so. I mean, maybe his last episode, the money with the whole thing with the Cadillac crash. And I think you're right. Probably there, but I mean, his raincoats episode, you talk about the pen. Sure. I give the pen an a plus, but his rank, you know, uh, you got, I jiggled it. Get the hell out of here with your knobs. The whole thing there is amazing. You talked about it earlier with the old people, the way they talk and you need Clompus there. He's not Clompus is there with Morty. You need that kind of antagonist with more when Jerry and just, Dad, it's Columbus hands in the phone. I mean, that is that epitomizes it all for me. The dad's friend calling the kid, yeah, and, then, and, then, and then my idiot son can open that line. What the hell did I do? The whole thing there with Columbus, and then we talked to Columbus's wife about how she had interactions with him. I mean, there's a lot there with Columbus other than the pen. So let's not just say it's the pen, uh, even in the original Cadillac. I mean, you're talking about three, five, and seven. You bring him back two years later, three different times, and he delivers every time. And the Cadillac he delivers. What, never driven a Cadillac before? Look at you, big shot here. Dinner after six. The whole thing. He's always there needling. Uh, you mentioned it earlier with Frank, the way they talk. I think Klompus brings that a lot. Uh, you listen, Sandy Barron, from my book. Uh, you, listen, I get it. You're a Morgan guy through and through. I respect it. But I got to go Klompus on this one. There's no way around it. Uh, I think you're selling him short on this later year drop and stuff. I, I disagree with that. I think he delivers every time he's there, uh, be, you know, between the, the, the knob and I got to fix your knob now. And the whole look at Mr. Big Shot and the Cadillac. I mean, 
everything the guy says is great. It, it, if you're talking pound for pound, you know, uh, screen time to deliver in, Kloppis is, is up there for me uh, as an all timer. So uh, I got to give it to Kloppis. Schmidt, you got to break this one for us. Yeah. And the, 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 the thing is with this one is that Chris had some great points and he has swayed me to the Mr. Morgan side, you know, from round one, round two, you know, he has some great points up until the, uh, his matchup here with Clumpus. Uh, and yeah, this is probably one of the, the most difficult ones yet to, to figure out and, and make a tiebreaker a decision. Uh, so it, it's just a gut thing. And I'm going to side with Tony with Clumpus. Uh, even though, uh, you know, I became more of a Mr. Morgan fan as, as, as this went on, I'm still going with Clumpus. And uh, so unfortunately, no big upset in, in this, that round. And that means we're moving on uh, to the elite, mate, the elite eight matchups. And uh, we're going to go back to the David uh, bracket to see uh, who's moving on further. And this time, Tony, uh, Frank Costanza versus Bookman. Well, here we are. I, I almost didn't put Frank through, which uh, may have surprised a lot of people, including myself, to be honest with you. I went with my gut at the end there. Where Howard kind of pushed me over the edge. Um, in the end, I think the right the right person won, to be fair. Um, I just wanted to give, give uh, Cortez a nod because I thought he really deserved it. But in this case, in this matchup, uh, I am going to go with Frank Estanza in this matchup. I think over Bookman, I think Frank is the call here uh, for every point O'Hara made in swaying, in swaying uh, Frank to get this far. Uh, you're talking about, you know, how can you trade Jay Buhner? Uh, a great point to hire made earlier. I'll just reiterate them the way he talks, everything about, and I think he's right. I think a lot of he did write. I think we talked to a few of the writers who told us that Frank would, he couldn't say a lot of the lines they'd write for him. So he would just kind of make up his own kind of lines here and there, um, which, which definitely shows, um, I think, you know, as good as Bookman is and as classic as that scenes are, and, and, and you know, it'll live on forever. I think character wise uh, in this one, two matchup, um, I got to go with Frank. Uh, who's having sex with a chicken? Uh, you know, how can you trade Jay Buhner? Uh, you know, this is a prophylactic rapper and mutilating squirrels on and on and on. Uh, Frank Estanza gets my, my vote here in the one, two matchup to go on to the final four. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Chris, over to you. Uh, tough matchup here. Uh, one, two, but who do you got moving on? Incredible matchup. I mean, one, two seed. what you would expect. The interesting thing here is, I mean, and again, we're talking about Frank up a lot here. Frank didn't come on the show till season what five, or I mean four in theory, I guess. But you know, at the handicap with the original dad, so interesting, just interesting uh, there. But again, we're big season five guys, so it's hard to you know, Bookman's Bookman. But I agree with Tony here. We're gonna we're gonna move Frank on to the final four. Yeah, I see no issues with that. So uh, moving on to the other uh, Elite Eight uh, matchup in the Charles division, uh, that's Estelle Costanza versus Alton Benes. And Chris, uh, who do you got moving on? The interesting thing about March Madness is, you know, you can be rooting for one team one week, and the next week it changes because it's about matchups. So everything I said about Alton Benes – against tina because of that pureness of laugh i'm going with the guy who just yeah he packs the the punch right tony mancha stills in 20 plus episodes uh you know a ton of highlights a ton of highlights but when you're talking best character one-time performance you put on that episode you're not turning it off. You may put on an Estelle episode and turn it off. You know, the doll, for instance. I can actually I can like that. Tony hated the doll, but episodes like that, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, to get their reaction, you know, who's the funny man? Da, 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 you know, I gotta make a phone call. The whole thing, uh, quite yeah. Schmidt mentioned uh, quiet down, chorus boy making Jerry feel so uncomfortable about the jacket. 
Um, nice Pakistani place. You're not scared of a little heat. I mean, every you're right. Every line he had was top notch and not wasted, and and he delivered. Uh, I can't say that about Estelle throughout the run. Um, so again, and I, listen. Uh, sometimes longevity helps. Not in this case. We're moving. Uh, we're moving Elaine Dad on the next. If oh, all right, uh, and Tony, your your thoughts here. Uh, who, who's moving on? Your opinion? Yeah, and 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 I'm going to touch on O'Hara's earlier point with Frank, where we don't see him till season five. Uh, you know, with Estelle, we don't see her till that contest in season four. Um, and and. and I think that's a lot said there. I think O'Hara's point about longevity is very good point because at some point that has to come into play. We can't just keep saying like, oh, yeah, but what about, you know, what about the contest? What about, uh, you know, what am I going to do the sandwich? Like I said, to me, uh, Frank has an edge over Estelle. That That's why Frank moved on. I, I don't think Estelle holds the same. Uh, she doesn't hold that same, uh, you know, oomph, if you will, that that Frank holds. In, in in this case, she, she when you put her up as I mentioned, when you put her up against Alton Bennis, I don't think she wins either. I think he there there's nothing he says that's not good in that episode. Every line he delivers, just his presence alone is enough to carry the whole episode. Just him sitting there in silence with the guys is enough. Everything about this guy, you know, to see him in in, in Reservoir Dogs playing that part, I mean, it's the same part, but you got instead of you got a bunch of criminals with them in Reservoir Dogs, you got. George, Jerry and George on a couch, you know, drinking from a cranberry juice. I mean, enough of this. It's too good. It's too good of a scene, too good of a of, of an episode, too good of a character uh, to not advance him. And I love the fact that he's only in one episode, whatever the reason is, who knows? He, you know, they didn't like him on the set, whatever you want to say about the guy. You know, he was he was Elaine's dad and you never saw him again. Right. Uh, you know, even Babs got got a shot later on. But, you know, this was his shot. He nailed it. Uh, you know, we get a lot out of this. This is this is Elaine, you know, who Elaine is because of him. I don't know wh- where I'm going with that one. But uh, to Harris point, I think Estelle doesn't have enough. Um, you you love Estelle because she's Estelle. But if you really start analyzing and diving into her character, there's not enough there to carry her past this round. In fact, you know, you know, maybe she didn't even have to make it this far, but she did for a reason. One seed is out. Venice advances to the final four. That's right. Pendant, those bastards. So, yeah, Alton definitely moves on, in my opinion, too. Uh, so, that, uh, go to the other side of the bracket, over to Melman and Babu, number five, and still hanging in there, Ping, number 10 seed. Which one advances, Tony? This is a tough one, man. We've been saying this through and through. This is the the real bracket that got off chalk fast. Uh we, we, we made arguments for both of these guys throughout this bracket, and now it's coming down to the matchup. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where, uh, again, I think, I think Babu, I think, I think Babu, uh, you know, I've been saying this throughout for other characters. I think Babu kind of falls into that Jackie Childs realm as you start to get to this point. If, if we're really dissecting it, he became bigger than he was. Um, you know, it's almost like the, the, the finger point became the thing because of the finale. And, and that always never sat well with me. Uh, I, I liked it early on. It was more spontaneous with you're a bad man, but then he kind of played it out a little bit. Um, you know, the, the visa that we mentioned was great. Um, but to what we're talking about here, to the essence of the show, to, to character driven show, uh, you know, I'll go back to the Nick jacket just, just because it's there. It's, it's that 90s, early 90s, you know, New York, Chinese delivery guy wearing the Nick's jacket, you know, the pea pods of the higher mentioned. Uh, I'm gonna go ping. I mean, we got to this point, and I think he upsets Babu as well in this, in this particular case. All right, uh, Chris, make it official. Uh, is ping moving on? My God, Ping is like uh, 1980, Raleigh Massimino with Villanova in 85. Now, Babu's not Georgetown yet. He hasn't reached that. He hasn't reached Ewing. And I don't I don't agree with all Tony's points on Babu. I don't think he got, he, he didn't become like Jackie Childs. I, 
the finale, you kind of just throw the finale away. They bring back it. It's soup nuts. Brought back everybody. Love Babu. But agree with my partner here. We're going to move Ping on. And this is unbelievable. Ping is in the final four, folks. How about that, folks? I would not have seen that in all my years of watching Seinfeld that Ping would make it this far. But here we go. That's March of Madness. Uh, so, uh, Chris, staying with you. Crazy Joe Davola versus Klompus. Number four num- versus number two. Uh, one's got to go. Uh, so who's advancing? It's all about matchups. And, you know, I didn't vote for either of these guys in the last round. So just think about that. But I got to vote for someone here. And for me, I'm staying consistent with my consistency here. I'm going crazy Joe Devola. I think he was in the most magical season. I think he was incredible during that whole season. Do I think he was the best character of that season? Potentially not. But this is Mark Madness. So you, you play who you play. Um, not always the best team wins. That makes sense. And Klampus, you know, I, I listen. You can only carry the pen so far. And, you know, Tony loves the Cadillac stuff and the eating at five o'clock. And we know how he feels about Clompus. And, and I'm probably not going to change that. But for me, it's, it's, it's Devola. I mean, he's so unique. I mean, yeah, we talk about relatability, the old voice, the way people talk. Yeah. But what about this nut job? This is unbelievable. To, to put this in the, you know, 9, 930 sitcom. Uh, at that time, was just unbelievable. Uh, so for me, I'm going to go with the four seed here in Crazy Joe. All right, Tony, your thoughts on Clumpus versus Crazy Joe? You're right. It, it, he's right about matchups, folks. And to me, this could be the finals. So I, I, that's where I stand with this matchup. So uh, these are two of my top three, I would probably say, of all time. This is the hardest choice I got to make. Uh but this is a no brainer actually, as I, as I, as I dive deeper into it. Uh, and, and it's crazy. Cause again, these are probably two of my top three. I think this, this could be the finals. If you asked me to come up with the bracket, these would both be one seeds. I did come up with this bracket, but I was trying to, you know, it's a selection committee. Uh, crazy Joe Davola advances in this case to me, uh, hands down because of just, Everything about this guy, every line this guy delivered was was the line of the episode. He never wasted a line. Everything he said was perfect. Going to the opera, you know, uh, you know, with the clown stuff and, and kicking everyone's ass there. The, the sick, the, you know, the, the standing up in the pilot episode, the something on my tongue stuff. Unbelievable character. Yeah. Top, top character of all time. Only Larry Charles come up with this character. Or Harry keeps bringing up the season four stuff. He carried season four through from the, from the, from the pitch to the actual pilot. He was there the whole time, you know, putting the Kai bash on, you know, Jerry trying to get uh tackleberry and the, the help him out the whole thing. Uh, crazy Joe, uh, compasses run ends for me here. Uh, I advanced crazy Joe as well. All right. Well, uh, I was prepared to do a tiebreaker and I was going to side with crazy Joe Devola, but it didn't have to folks. So we got our final four all set. And uh, this time, you know, Chris, let's start off with you. Frank Costanza versus Alton Bennis. Uh, You know, we got a one-two matchup on that side. Pretty much expected that. What do you got? Who's going to the championship? Another great matchup. Uh, Call it the, uh, you know, the senior citizen bracket over here. But that is what it is. I mean. That's what makes us laugh. That's what resonates with us clearly um, versus the other side of the bracket, which really two unique, uh, you know, offerings, if you will. Yeah, Frank Costanza essentially one episode of season four and then carried, carried uh, many of the later seasons. Uh, obviously, five was an all-timer. The non-fat yogurt, the... Uh, uh, the conversion, the cigar serini, and the rain. You forget about the raincoats, right? Uh, Moth infested uh, Quebec wear. Um, just some really iconic episodes. The bra stuff. Uh, uh, 
the ass man, right? Fusilli Cherry, we, we forget about that. Um, the understudy to, to some degree um, with that, with uh, Amy Hill, the Korean woman. I mean, just he's all over the place, but with consistency, with bravado. I mean, when you think of Seinfeld, you think of Frank Costanza. A a any way you shake it, like it's the big four are the big four, but Frank is just so relatable. I mean, I put it, I, I put on an episode for my children and they're laughing at Frank. Would they laugh at all, Alton Bennis? Perhaps, but I don't think so. Uh, I think Frank touches everybody, and for that reason, he moves on. All right. Yeah. Thank you. And an interesting uh, thing here is you, uh, we got two Korean war veterans facing off to go to the championship and Tony, you got to send one of them there. Who's your pick? Yeah. I mean, here, here's the thing too, about Frank is it, it's without Frank. The, the later seasons are, 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 are even worse than we sometimes say they are. Right. So a, a lot of thing about Frank is he's, he's got, he's, he fits those later season episodes because he is a character and that's what we're talking about here. Right. All his stuff is a lot of yelling and a lot of, you know, serenity. Now the foot odor stuff, uh, you know, we're going to be a lock stock and barrel, uh, you know, the feats of strength stuff with, with, um, with, uh, you know, Festivus, uh, but then he also has that, that other side, the uh, who's having sex with the chicken side and, and that whole thing. So, uh, just a man of many layers. Uh, one of the greatest sitcom characters of all time. I know I almost bounced him earlier on, but that was really just, that was to mix things up a bit. And, and I wanted to, I really just liked Cortez as a character, but there's no way around Frank. I mean, he's going to win this battle every time. Uh, there's really no, no contest here. Uh, as, as great as, as Alton Bennis was, it was one episode and Frank carries the show. Uh, for much of, of, of the later years um, and really just uh, delivers on all cylinders. So, yeah, Frank Estan just going to the finals. Yeah, right. Frank, you know, delivers over the years, whereas who knows if Alton was a, a you know recurring character, what could have become of him? They could have ruined him. But luckily, we have a you know lasting memory of his great performance. So other side of the bracket, Ping versus Crazy Joe Davola, number 10 seed making it to the final four. Tony, start us off with this one. Ping versus Crazy Joe. Who, who's moving on? Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of just get, I gave away my hand earlier. I, I, Crazy Joe to me is, is without a doubt, one of the greatest characters you're ever going to find in a sitcom. I mean, it doesn't get any better than him. Uh, you know, with the door open with Elaine, uh, I like to encourage intruders. He goes from the no obligation, no, you're under no obligation to shake my hand to Elaine when he says, uh, I like to encourage intruders. I mean, everything about this guy just, just is incredible. I, there's nothing like it you've ever seen before. Uh, the delivery, the writing, every scene he's in. Um, you know, we got ping this far. I, I can't I can't advance him past Crazy Joe. Uh, they're, they're, they're complete opposites in every respect. Uh, so it's an interesting matchup. It's one of those as, as March Madness goes, you always look for the matchups. You know, it's a team that may not be the best team on paper, but they match up well. Uh, you know, Ping is everything that, that Crazy Joe is not. Ping's likable. He's in every man. He's in the fabric of, of New York City. He's buddies with Kramer, the whole thing. Uh but but for for characterness and just grittiness and everything we love about the early seasons, uh, you know, there's nothing like Crazy Joe. Uh, he he advances for me. All right, yeah, thank you, Tony uh, and Chris. Your thoughts on this matchup and who should be moving on, in your opinion? I agree. There's nothing like Crazy Joe, but you know, they say you grow hair and look like Stalin, and you know uh, the impotence joke. Uh, I mean. When you think about Seinfeld, like, do, do you think of Crazy Joe Davola? Perhaps. Do you think about Ping? Perhaps. Here's the thing with Ping. Don't sleep on Ping. I mean, the, the beauty of the show is the underdog nature, the guest star. I mean, this show was built by, by two guys who didn't know what the hell they were doing. 
And in comes this guy, Ping, as a character you wouldn't even think of who had such an impact on everything Tony just said. The fabric of the show was that apartment building and what went on between those walls with that neighbor uh, and the ex-girlfriend. And and Ping was this... <laughs> as crazy it is, he was the center of it all. Elaine hit him. Uh, George with the cream. Obviously, Jerry and uh, Kramer ordering from him consistently um, on a first-name basis. Who the hell is on a first-name basis with the Chinese delivery guy? That's Ping. I, do I have a soft spot for Ping? Yes. Is there something about him that just makes you feel good when you're watching this show? Yes. And that's what I want to feel. Do I want to go down that dark road with Crazy Joe? I don't think so. For me, I'm going ping. Wow. So a tiebreaker here in the final four. All right. So ping versus Crazy Joe. I mean, listen, Crazy Joe, yeah, he wasn't around. He never made it into Jerry's apartment, left a message on his phone. Uh, you say he's, you know, in the fabric of the show. You know, listen, Kramer knows Davola. Obviously, Jerry knows him. Uh, Elaine dated him. Uh, and if it comes down to just gut reaction, I'm going with Crazy Joe. Uh, and he's my pick to move on uh, to the final against Costanza, Frank Costanza. So, uh, yeah, somebody had to go there, and it's uh, it's Crazy Joe. So, uh, Chris, we have our matchup in the, in the final now. Frank Costanza versus Crazy Joe Javola. Somebody's got to go home with the trophy. Who is it? Uh, wonderful bracket here. Uh, lots of upsets. Uh, lots of no-brainers. Uh, I'm going to send both of you that ping starter jacket so you guys have that uh, the Knicks jacket. You guys should both be having that for the rest of your life. Great effort by ping there. How we made it to the Final Four, we'll ever know. But uh, again, the beauty of the show is these, these guest stars you don't think about elevating it but you become the number one show ever because of iconic secondary cast and this whole list was was full of them but this guy stood out from the rest i talked about it enough already for me it's frank costanza uh he the father of george costanza I mean, what, what more can you say? I mean, the character we loved in those first four seasons, right? George, in the back of our head, we're like, where did this guy come from? And then they introduced Frank, and boy, did we find out. Incredible stuff. Uh, again, he wasn't there the first, essentially first four seasons for all intents and purposes. Uh, and for someone like that to deliver as the greatest, uh, he really had to step it up, and boy, did Frank step it up. So for me, I'm moving on Frank to be the the the, the crown champion here. Would love to hear my partner's thoughts um, to see who we crown. Absolutely. Uh, so Tony, let's get it to it. Uh, what's your final thoughts on these uh, uh, two matchups of uh, Frank and Crazy Joe? Yeah, we're here. We made it. Uh, listen, the uh, Ping had a hell of a run. Uh, there were some upsets along the way. Um, I think, um, personally, I thought Crazy Joe. Uh, you know, like I said earlier, he could have been. The, he made it to the finals, and I think uh, he is a character. He's he's as good as a character gets. Uh, so many layers there. This was the beauty of the show. Is right. We have Ping, who's just an everyday man just kind of makes his way into the apartment, makes himself at home. The impetus joke was great that I mentioned earlier. Just really just, you know, they brought him back in, in a great way, you know, with the, with the cousin and everything, the shark um, wasn't forced or nothing like that. Um, and crazy Joe, complete opposite. And then you have Frank, I mean, to a Harris point, 
there's nothing like Frank Estanza delivering lines. Um, you know, I love it. He brought it up earlier, but I don't, you know, you go back to this one, the non fight you know, the thing is just talking about you. He think he's made an appointment like that kind of stuff. That's fatherly stuff that you don't get. That's who George Costanza is. He's got this guy over there telling him, you know, you know, that time when he hits him on the head, you know, just laying on the couch or, you know, the catch up stuff and, uh, you know, yelling at Estelle, obviously we love the surrounding now stuff can get a little bit crazy, but, um, it is what it is. The prophylactic rapper. Um, th- there's really, you know, you want to get crazy with the facility stuff. You want to get, uh, you know, with, with things like that, the doll, um, you know, those kind of things, but the real essence of Frank is always the same. It's always there. Um, you- you're not going to, you're not going to find a better character and a better person to deliver that character. Uh, there's a reason why he he became the guy after the handicap spot. Um, there, there's it may be unfair even for the bracket to to have had him in it because it was kind of a clear winner. I, we thought I was trying to find a spot to pick him off. Thought maybe with Cortez, but uh, in, in hindsight, it wasn't going to happen. Obviously, um, and not even Crazy Joe is going to is going to is going to knock him off. Uh, Bennis couldn't knock him off. Uh, Costanza is your, your winner of, of the, of the bracket. Uh, uh, that, that's kind of, you know, that's what we got. Frank Costanza, you know, what the hell did you trade Jay Buna for? He had me at that line. Uh, that's where we got it. Yeah. I, I mean, his path was always to the final in my opinion, and he got there and, yeah, he just dominated, uh, I think against crazy Joe Davola. So there you have it, folks. Frank Costanza, winner of our best character bracket. We appreciate you guys tuning in and hope you had fun with this. And uh, we'll hope to see um, more of you back for uh, future brackets.